fire and focus in on what you have for us today, the message that you have for us. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time that we spend together. I pray that it would be beneficial for each and every one of us who hears this message. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to share one of my all-time favorite stories. Some of you guys may be familiar with this one. Three friends decided to go deer hunting together. A warrior, a doctor, and a preacher. As they were walking along came a big buck. The three of them shot simultaneously. Immediately the buck dropped to the ground and all three rushed to see how big it actually was. Upon reaching it, they couldn't determine whose shot had actually killed the deer. As a heated debate ensued, a few minutes later, a game officer came by and asked what the problem was. The doctor told him that they were debating who shot the buck. The officer took a look at the buck, and within a few seconds, he said with much confidence, the preacher shot the buck. They all wondered how he knew that so quickly. The officer said, easy. The bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> Although this joke may gently make fun of preachers, it actually illustrates a more serious challenge to all of us. Namely, as we listen to God's word, as we read it or have it preached, do we allow God's message for us to go in one ear and out the other? Do we hear God's word without allowing it to transform us? Do we actually do what the Word of God says. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn back to the book of James in the New Testament. James chapter 1. And we're going to be looking uh, at a section of Scripture, uh, verses 18 through 27. We started a series in James, and uh, today I wanted to look at this section of Scripture. Some of it is going to cover a little bit of what we went over last week. And also getting into uh, some new stuff. And it's definitely one of my favorite books of the Bible, the book of James. Uh, it's something that, as you read it, it really will hit home with you. Uh, just the practical wisdom that it gives uh, and the uh, great instruction that it gives as well. James chapter 1, uh, we're going to begin with verse 18. Just as a reminder... Um, the author of this book was most likely uh, the brother of Jesus, and he was a great leader uh, in the Jerusalem church. There were definitely challenges that the early readers uh, would have had, uh, the early audience of this uh, letter, or this book. And what's awesome is uh, how applicable the instruction that's given uh, is for all of us, no matter what our situation is. So... Let's go ahead and take a look, beginning at verse 18, and let's see what this says together. I actually want to read the whole section first, and then we'll get into some specifics. James chapter 1, verse 18, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, and not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
you know, guys, it's interesting. You look at that section, and it, it feels like when you first read it, it feels like, man, James is kind of jumping around a little bit. He's covering a lot of subjects. But something I want to call your attention to is that as you look at that section of Scripture, you'll notice that there is a common word that is being used, and it's word. Look again at that section of Scripture and look for every place that you see that word mentioned. Verse 18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. You take a look further, verse 21, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Guys, we are looking at this and there is a clear message that James is giving here. And he is giving it about the word of truth, the word of God, the scripture, the gospel message. James is not content to just give people some sage advice and just kind of leave it at that. With James, what he's doing right now is he's kind of stepping into people's worlds and stepping into their lives and challenging them and saying, hey, you guys are hearing the message, you're hearing the good news, you're hearing the scriptures, you're hearing the Bible. But are you doing what it says? Is it affecting your life? Is it making a difference in the way that you talk, in the way that you walk, in the way that you go about your life? That's a challenge for all of us. Going back to the beginning of the text, James chapter 1, verse 18, it says, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Be born spiritually through the Word. Be born spiritually through the Word. Birth through the Word gives us a clear indication of the spiritual nature of this message. A natural birth occurs involving a womb. But a spiritual birth involves the Word. That phrase, first fruits, calls to mind Old Testament images of the first portion of the harvest that will be given to the Lord, a first taste of that which was going to arrive. The early Christians were a preliminary indication of the multitude of people in the centuries to come who would be born again. None of us who have come to believe in Jesus could have gotten to that place without the scripture. <laughs> without the gospel message, the good news about Jesus. It is through the word that we are born spiritually. Be born spiritually through the word. Now again, going back to the text, James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, this is kind of what we were covering last week. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Guys, receive the word. Receive the word. This really gives us the context, the surrounding context of what we were talking about just last week and what James is trying to communicate. He wants the righteousness that God desires to be produced in the lives of all believers. I, have you ever heard that phrase that God loves you, but he loves you so much he doesn't want you to stay that way? God wants to make a difference in your life. He wants to affect the words that you use, the choices that you make, because he always has in mind what's best for you, and he knows what's best for you. Just like as a parent, 
a lot of you guys, you know what's best for your kids. They don't always do that. They don't always act on that. They don't always accept your teaching. But so often in their lives, you know what's best for them. You know what things are out there that might harm them. You know what things are out there that might help them. And as you try to direct them, as you try to teach them, sometimes that goes well, sometimes it's very challenging, sometimes it's very frustrating. But the truth is, guys, when you're a parent, it gives you a little window into what it's like for God, because he is our heavenly father. And he's trying to, to bring us along, he's trying to teach us and instruct us in these commandments that he gives, he gives them because he knows what's best for us. And so the Bible talks about this accepting the word, receiving the word. You know what will make it harder to receive the word? Being slow to listen, being quick to speak, being quick to become angry. There is a reason James was talking about those things. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God wants. And I'm not talking about a righteous anger when you see an injustice or you see something that's not fair. I'm talking about human anger, human anger that sometimes is very hot-tempered, a quick reaction. Maybe you don't have a full picture of something, but you get mad. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God wants. It also says, therefore, in the text. This is including stuff we've gone over previously in James. Remember discussing temptation and persevering under trial, being willing to listen, not letting our human anger take over. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word. I think modern day American Christians get too comfortable sometimes. We want to have it both ways. We want Jesus, but we want the world too. We don't flee from immorality, we run to it. We see how far we can get to the line and sometimes end up crossing it. Receiving the word means humbling ourselves. Did you see in the text that said, humbly accept the word? There may be some things that we want or some things we want to do, and they're tempting to us. But if it goes against God, it doesn't have a place in our lives. We belong to Jesus. James talks about the word planted in you. So you can pick, picture that in your mind. So many of you in this room, you've planted things before. You've dug a hole, you've put seeds in the ground, and you've planted something. The whole idea with planting something, you want to get it in there. And so when he talks about the word planted in you to um, his audience here, he understands that the people listening to this have likely already received the message. This means he is speaking to people who have already become believers. When he says, which can save you, is a reference to the fact that the gospel message is the message that saves souls. One commentator said this about this uh, section. James is not calling for an initial acceptance of that message, but for a full appropriation of the truth as the Christian grows in spiritual understanding. Receive the word. Now we go on in the text, and we go to James chapter 1, verse 22. This is one of the real highlight verses of this entire book. I love when people can be direct. Sometimes when people are uh, trying to get real fancy with language, they uh, speak in a very indirect way. Sometimes that, that can be good. Sometimes it's a, a good way of getting somebody to understand a point. But a lot of times I really like when things are very direct. And this verse is very direct. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. That verse captured, in my mind, so much of what this book is all about. It says in verse 23, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself 
goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. How often is it that people read the Bible or they come to church on a Sunday morning and they listen to a sermon and they think to themselves, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Or, yeah, that's, that's something I need to change. But they close their Bibles or they leave the church building, the change doesn't happen. They don't, they listen to the word, but they don't actually do what it says. When a temptation comes up, they just go with it. He makes a great illustration of somebody who does that, being anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It is uh, a sad thing to see somebody whose who's memory might be failing. I've seen instances where a politician might get up on stage and they, they give their whole talk and then when they're getting ready to leave the stage, they get lost because they don't know where to go. It's like they've forgotten where to go. It's uncomfortable to see that happen. And that's a great example of what this is. It's somebody who reads the word, who listens to the word, but then after doing that, they go away and they forget about it. It says in verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. I heard this story on July 24, 2013. A train carrying 218 people in eight carriages derailed in northwestern Spain, killing 79 people and hospitalizing another 66. Shortly after the wreck, the driver, Francisco Jose Garzón Amo, told officials, I can't explain it. I still don't understand how I didn't see. I just don't know. He said the journey was going fine until the train hit a curve. At that point, Garzon said to himself, Oh my, the curve, the curve, the curve. I won't make it. Despite Garzon's initial confusion and surprise, there is a simple explanation for the crash. Video footage revealed that the train was going as fast as 119 miles per hour before it hit the deadly curve. That's more than twice the speed limit for that section of the track. There was a, a speed limit there for a specific reason because that curve was coming up and it was going to be dangerous if you were going over that speed limit. He saw the sign, but he didn't do what the sign said. So it wasn't just the speed that caused the accident. It was the combination of the speed and the location of the track. The train was designed to reach speeds of over 130 miles per hour but Garzon, who was a 30-year employee of Spain's National Rail Company, simply ignored the boundaries in which those high speeds were to be used. God has laid down the trap for us so we don't wreck our lives or the lives of other people. We ignore his speed limits and his commands at our own peril. There is an emphasis here on not just listening, but do we? We listen to the word of God and then we do what it says. Those last few verses of this chapter, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. If the words that we speak don't match up what we say we believe, then that religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To what? To, 
look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You see in that command to uh, take care of orphans and widows in their distress, you see in it uh, a reflection of the, the greatest commandments. When Jesus was asked what's the greatest commandment, he said essentially to love God and to love people. And so there is a command there for every believer to be good to others, to love our neighbors, and to help take care of them. And it says in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We've got to remember that we belong to Jesus. And so the choices that we make need to be dictated by what he wants us to do. Do what the word says. There is a story, a, a woman named Susan Kimber shared this short interaction she had with her son. I wanted to share it with you. I think it kind of captures what our attitude needs to be. She said, tired of struggling with my strong-willed three-year-old son, Thomas, I looked him in the eye and asked a question I felt sure would bring him in line. Thomas, who's in charge here? Not missing a beat, our Sunday school born and bred toddler replied, Jesus is. You know, the truth is, guys, is that wasn't exactly the answer she was looking for, but the truth is, yeah, that's the right answer. That should be the right answer in each one of our lives. So when it comes to your life, if I were to ask you that question, who's in charge here? What would the answer be in your life? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the ways in which you give us your word. And so, Lord, as we consider what we have talked about this morning, I pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, encourage and teach each one of us. Help us not only to open our Bibles and to read them and to listen to these words. I pray that each one of us would accept them. I pray that each one of us would receive them. And I pray that not only will we listen to your word, I pray that we would do what it says. Lord, through your Holy Spirit, would you convict us when we are going astray? Would you help us to understand when changes need to happen in our lives? Lord, we thank you that you have provided your word to us because we know that that in and of itself is an act of love. It's like a parent who cares enough to say to their child when they're going astray or when they're doing something that might harm them. Lord, you have given us your commands, your instructions, because you love us. And so, Lord, I pray that each one of us would have it on our hearts, would have it on our minds to open up your word, to read your word, and not only to listen, but to do what it says. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.